Okay, everybody, here we are, part two. Now, <clears throat> let's do the Guthrie story. I'd met Captain Guthrie. Uh, I heard he was environmentalist. He had lectured on the university. And at one time, he had requested that that uh, uh, they they wanted him to do a time, time capsule, and they wanted him to select the uh, things to bury in it. And he was nice enough to ask me if it was okay. At the time, I did a lot of photography, too. If it was okay for uh, for him to bury some of my photos and some of my environmental columns and I said well I was honored and uh, I had never met the man before that so I went up and met him that day and uh, we uh, uh, I don't know if we got together for lunch or what but but we had talked several times after that but then when the Everglades were burning I from his conversation I knew that he he owned a private plane besides being he was a 37th pilot highly hired by Eastern Airlines so <clears throat> we knew uh, uh, um, so, so I knew that he that he could fly me over the glades and I could get some pictures. So I, I called and he said, "Yeah, I'd be more than happy to." So when I got there, he had rented a plane and he'd taken the door off it. And his son was also a pilot. Uh, and I said, I stressed before, he was the 37th pilot hired by Eastern Airlines. And at the time, he was the senior pilot, meaning he had more hours than anybody else in, in the whole Eastern Eastern uh, organization. Uh, in the air. Well, anyway, he uh, so he takes me up, and and you've never felt anything until you're just buckled in by a little seatbelt and hanging out a window taking pictures, uh, poking along at 80, 90 miles an hour with all that wind coming in the door. But we got the pictures, and we become good friends. Well, a couple of months later, I read that he had been his flight status had been terminated by Eastern Airlines, and had been terminated because. He found that there was a what they call a DP can on every jet motor, commercial jet motor in the world, and that uh, this DP can, when the jet motor is shut off, this the kerosene. That's basically what je, commercial jet fuel is, is: kerosene. When when the motor shut off, this stuff recondensed and dumped into this DP can, and when they went to take off, the air pressure coming through the motor would force this this uh, several gallons of this kerosene either onto the runway or onto the next uh, to the windshield of the jet the next jet that's coming down the runway so he felt it was a safety hazard and that the only that the, the that all safety questions are questions uh, are that are uh, responded to by the captain alone now, that plane does not take off without his okay no matter who's you know no matter who you think is in charge it's him so he found a way of putting a hose in the motor in a hole and blowing through it and and having somebody with a bucket on the other end gathering up this kerosene which would be a couple of gallons per motor <clears throat> so the maintenance people were up in arms because they said you can't do that that's maintenance work this is a you know this is a union place and uh, and the, the pilots association they weren't willing to other pilots weren't willing to do it uh, and uh, Eastern Airlines said it's not a big problem just go ahead uh, don't hold up any planes and Guthrie refused he said because it's a safety hazard and they terminated his flight status well when I read that I said well there's got to be a resolution to this problem and it certainly isn't firing Guthrie so I instituted a boycott on Eastern Airlines and the lucky thing about uh, boycotts is that if you can offer and uh, this probably goes with all people, regardless of just college kids, that if you can offer people uh, an alternative where it doesn't hurt them any, they'll be happy to stand in your, and, and go shoulder to shoulder you with you in a boycott. And so all I was asking is that they fly. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, Miami was the hub for Eastern Airlines, that, uh, that they fly back and forth to New York or wherever they're going uh, in another in another airline by another airline so we we were costing them over a million dollars a week just at eastern uh, just at uh, miami and then we threatened to take it to take it uh, uh, national and i can show you the stuff from that but they uh, uh, they put their engineers on it and they found out that that uh, by plugging this hole that uh, the stuff would would re-vaporize and that and that resolved that and that it was a it was a cheap fix and that every Within a year, every jet engine, within months, every jet engine in Eastern was, was so modified. And within a year, every commercial jet engine in the world was so modified, preventing literally 
tens of millions of gallons of this stuff from going on the runways and into the windshields and and into the atmosphere. So uh, here's the thing: Eastern boycott ends, and because it ended, they hired Captain Guthrie back. And this is the way this is the way big business big business operates. They operate on this premise. Let's let's do what we can and, and keep the guy's mouth shut. So they reinstituted his flight status, made him the environmental spokesman for Eastern Airlines, and he had three years to go before he retired. And he never flew or never was sent any place to speak. And he and he drew his total salary. That's the way big business operates. They give you a job, shut you up, and bam, move on. All right, that's the Eastern story. Now. Here's a story about the ROTC, and of course that's my moniker. And uh, what happened was that uh, uh, there was a lot of turmoil uh, uh, all around the country in, in the late 60s, especially on universities. And one of the problems was the question of ROTC. Now, at no other college or university in the country did anyone attack the, the problem of ROTC by saying that they, the professors, the instructors, didn't have uh, academic freedom. And that was my approach, and no one else did it. And Mr. Mr. Jansen, I'd like to, to get your view on that. I'm sure you're an ROTC supporter. So what we did is we conducted a poll. We had we had all the uh, all the students vote, and the 62% favored getting rid of ROTC. It was a nonviolent demonstration, but it didn't happen at Harvard or Stanford or or Berkeley. It happened right there, and I made it happen. Okay, now here's where my there get flies in this day to Ridge University, to Ridge University of Miami. ROTC, and I've got to keep moving because there. now ROTC, they'd bring their students over in a nice, even, yeah, see they were doing cartoons about me even in those days. Uh, they'd bring students over in a nice, even, they march them over and have them, have them sign the petition and then march them back to their ROTC thing, which also was taking away from the supposed teaching time. Then I have debates. Here's here's another cartoon. He question should it be allowed? Pros and cons. Gadflies uh, uh, hear this and use bad arguments. Uh, con no credits for warring. And this was a, just more cartoons. And uh, by the way, this newspaper here that we're looking at. Uh, this oh, that's Captain Guthrie. That uh, this was considered by by voting of other of other universities. The for the, th the three years I did editorials, and I'm not saying that was a reason, but three years I did editorials, they were considered the best collegiate newspaper in the country. Circulation seventeen thousand, bigger than my local community here, and probably laid out better. But they were. Three years and they won the Pacemaker Award, and that's against Harvard, that's against Princeton, that's against Yale, that's against against uh, anybody you can name. The, the this was the best college in the, the college newspaper in the entire country. All right. Now here's where it says Gadfly's net 62% of the vote against it. Now along this time also it was the cops. It was the cops against the students, and I mean cops against the students. So, uh, as a graduate student, I didn't get to vote on this, but I got to suggest it, and I went through that they take a dollar that the that the, the uh, act, student activities, the people in charge of that, take a dollar from that one semester only from everybody's student activity fee, and they use the student activity fee to bring in different bands and groups and things. And I I could do a special on on that alone. My argument with Joan Baez and 
and and how Roberta Flack and a couple of people use some of my tapes to, to play between setups and stuff like that. Uh, we'll get to that. That's less important than this political stuff. But anyway, so they took a dollar out of everybody's activities fee, put it in a bond fund so that any student at the University of Miami, and this never, I repeat, this didn't happen at Harvard, Stanford, any other college in the, in the freaking country, but it did there, and it did it because I did it. Now, Mr. Scott, you can say that's blowing my horn, but uh, every once in a while, people are totally unaware of things like this. So they took that dollar out, and now all the student, if a student got arrested, he didn't have to deal with any bail bondsman that was going to rob him or anybody else. All he had to do was show his student ID, and he was bailed out. And this is for misdemeanor. This isn't for murder or, or giant drug crimes or something. This is... Uh, for misdemeanors that you'd have to sit in jail until you come up with some bail with, and I I resolved that, and and the and the students I don't know if they still have that or not, but if they do, uh, they still have it. It's the longest place in the country that has it because no one else no one else did at the time. Now here's here's that boycott stretched over Christmas one over Christmas that year. So I dressed up as Santa Claus and walked around campus with my brief bag this time saying uh, Boycott Eastern Airlines. And here's another one. Uh, states can never find peace through arming Asia militias. And that's what we were doing. Alright. Now, there was a time when, when, when the politics of new teachers was, was brought on the question, new professors, uh, because uh, this was a fairly right-wing group of people that ran the University of Miami. Now, uh, through, I, I had a lot of connections because people would feed me stuff uh, anonymously, and I'd get letters that, that would be like intercepted emails today uh, between this, the uh, upper echelons of the, the, you know, the vice president and the president of the college and things. Well, anyway, there was this man named uh, Crop, and and he recommended that that twenty, uh, I think it was twenty. I don't even remember now. It was twenty three or twenty six people not be granted tenure because of the political activity they had demonstrated. And this should never be a discussion of tenure. All it should be is is the fact of is whether these people can teach or not teach. So, I. Uh, wrote a number of articles. We exposed the Groff letter. I think it's in here someplace. Uh, there's so many things. It's so little time. <laughs> uh, okay, military professor, graduate students. This is from the Miami News. They did an article, an article on me. Uh, and there was a ABM uh, debate. Now uh, here's stuff about tenure. Well, anyway, I went to the, I went to these professors. Well, uh, after the Grop letter, uh, a, a number of them came to me. One, particularly Nancy Claspy, and said, "Is anything you can do?" I said, "Well, let let me go and meet with the others." And so all of this. All the all of these people met, and and in the process, uh, I said, "Well, listen." I said, "This letter, this this letter is patently wrong on its uh, and its wording and all that. It, it's obvious that it's for political reasons. These people are behind tenure." And I said, "We'll make a big deal out of this. The paper will back you, and and I'll I'll write uh, editorials on it." And I said, I was pretty sure we could save your jobs. One guy that was teaching at the engineering school said, I don't want nothing to do with you, hippie this, you hippie this and that. And I said, fine, and we'll, we'll leave you out of it. Out of the, and uh, anyway, out of those 20, 25 people, 24 of them got tenure. Uh, our good friend at the uh, engineering school was denied tenure. Uh, now, there's an ordinance on a flag uh, seven seventy nine fifteen, and uh, and it was written in such a fashion. Uh, well, we we'll have to pick up with seventy nine fifteen in part three, and I hope this doesn't go too much past part four or five. Uh, I'll be right back with you, people. Thank you very much for your time.